The Ladder of Divine Ascent Step 4 On Obedience Our essay now, out of necessity, covers fighters and athletes of Christ. As the flower comes out before the fruit, so detachment of the body, or will, always come before obedience. For with the aid of these two virtues, the divine soul steadfastly goes up to the heavens as on wings of gold. Perhaps it was concerning this that the one who received the Holy Spirit sang, Who will give me wings as a dove? I will fly by action, and I will rest through meditation and humbleness. However, let us not fall short, if you agree, to relate in detail in our essay the ornaments of these courageous warriors, how exactly they grip the shield of their faith in God and their guide, and with it how they fight off, so to speak, every notion of unbelief and wavering, how they regularly lift up the drawn sword of the Spirit and kill all the desires that come to them, how clothed in the iron armor of humbleness and long-suffering they ward off every affront, injury, and arrow. For a helmet of salvation, they have the abbot's protection by prayer. And when they stand, their feet are not together, but one is stretched out in service, and the other is unmoving in prayer. Obedience is the abandonment of our own life through the deeds of our body. Or stated another way, obedience is the putting to death of the members of our body while the mind stays alive. Obedience is not doubting, a willing death, an uncomplicated life, danger free of concern, a rapid defense by God, courage at death, a safe journey, a sleeper's advancement. Obedience is the grave of the will and the resurrection of meekness. A dead body does not debate or vacillate between good and evil. For the one who has piously killed the soul of a novice will give answer for all things. Obedience is a renunciation of discrimination in a treasure of discernment. To begin, the mortification of the will of the soul and body requires much labor. The middle often involves toil, but at some points it is without pain. However, the conclusion is an indifference toward labor and pain. Only at the point he observes himself doing his will does the living corpse feel pain and grief of heart for he is concerned when faced with the responsibility of exercising his own judgment. You, the one who has made up his mind to strip himself for the arena of the spiritual confession, you, the one who desires to take the yoke of Christ on his neck, you, the one who is attempting to put your weight on someone else's shoulders, you, the one who is hurrying to make an oath to give up your life to slavery, for which you desire to have freedom put to your account, you, the one who is upheld by the hands of others, swimming across this great ocean. It is best that you understand that you have made the decision to journey over the short but difficult path from which only one path forks, which is called a singularity. However, the one who has renounced all this, even in those things which seem to be spiritual and excellent and well-pleasing to God, has reached the finish line even before starting his travels. For obedience is the disbelief of all things which pertain to oneself, however excellent they may seem, until the conclusion of one's life. When the goal of meekness and the desire of salvation force us to bend our neck and deliver ourselves over to someone else in the Lord, before embarking on this life, if there be any evil or arrogance in us, we should initially question and study it, and so, that is to say, test our navigator so that we not confuse the sailor and the navigator, an ill person for a physician, a lustful person for a dispassionate one, the open sea for the safe harbor, and thus have the result of a quick shipwreck of our life. For when we have come to the arena of divinity and obedience, we should not act as judge over our guide, even if we see in him some small failing, since he is only human. For if we make ourselves a judge, we will get no gain from our subjugation. It is highly important for the ones who desire to keep an unwavering faith in their superiors to record their good works in, effaceably in our hearts and to ever bring them to mind. So when the devils so distrust in us against them, we are able to rebuke them by these memories. For the greater faith abounds in the heart, the more the body becomes eager. But the one who trips up by not trusting has stumbled already. For everything that does not come from faith is sin. 
The instant the idea of acting as judge or condemning your spiritual director comes to your mind, flee from it as from sexual immorality. Do not give the serpent any authority, room, entry, or permission. Instead say, Hear, O deceiver, I have no power to be a judge of my spiritual director, for he has been established as a judge over me. It is not my place to judge him. The fathers have established that psalmody is a weapon, and that prayer is a wall, and sincere tears are a cleansing. But holy obedience is in their judgment a declaration of faith the absence of which will not allow anyone to see the Lord who is under the power of his passions. The one who subjugates himself passes a judgment against himself. Even if he is in perfect obedience to the Lord, although it may seem imperfect, he will evade judgment. However, if he acts on his own will in some areas, then even though he thinks himself to be obedient, he puts the weight on his own shoulders. It is better if the spiritual director does not stop rebuking him. However, if he becomes silent, then I have no words. Those who surrender themselves to the Lord in purity run a good race without embittering the bile of the devils through their questioning. At the beginning, let us give our confession to the excellent judge and only to him. However, if he so bids, then to everyone. Cuts displayed in public will not become worse, but will heal. I once observed in a monastery a dreadful judgment from the excellent judge and pastor. For when I was there, a thief came to the monastery wanting to take on the monastic life. And the most superb pastor and doctor commanded him to rest for seven days, so he might see the manner of life there. When the days were finished, the pastor summoned him and inquired of him in private, Do you still desire to stay with us? Seeing that he consented with all honesty, he then inquired as to what ill he had done while in the world. And observing that he related to him everything with all innocence, he pushed him still more and stated, I would like you to stay this before all the brothers. The men really did disdain his sins, and leaving aside all shame, he immediately vowed to do it. And if you desire, he stated, I will say it in the midst of Alexandria. So the pastor collected all his sheep into the church, about 230 during the Sunday service, at the conclusion of the reading of the gospel. He introduced this thief. He was dragged by many of the brothers, who hit him moderately. They then bound his hands behind him. He was clothed with a hair, shirt, and had ashes upon his head, and everyone was astonished at his appearance. Suddenly, a terrible cry was heard, for none knew what was occurring. Then, at the point the thief reached the doors of the church, that pastor who had a love for all souls said to the thief in a loud voice, Halt! You are not worthy to come here. Silenced by the command of the pastor proceeding from the sanctuary, for he told us afterwards that he heard thunder and not a human voice at all, he immediately collapsed to the floor on his face. His whole body was shaking with fear as he lay on the floor, wetting it with his tears. This most excellent doctor of souls used every possible means for his salvation. Desiring to make an example of his saving and effective humbleness, again he encouraged him before everyone to relate in detail all he had done and with trembling he acknowledged every one of his sins, which disgusted every ear, not just the fleshly sins, but natural and unnatural ones with people and with animals. He had also committed poisonings, murders, and numerous other things which are not seemly to listen to or to put in writing. When finally his confession was finished, the pastor immediately instructed him to be given his monastic garb and that he be added to the brethren. Awed by the sagacity of the holy man, I inquired from him when we were in private. Why did you make such a big show of him? And that true doctor answered, for two reasons. First, to save the penitent from future embarrassment by present embarrassment. And it truly did that, Brother John, for he did not come up off the floor until all his sins were pardoned. And have no doubt of this, for I, one of the brothers, told me, I observed someone horrible holding a reed and a tablet for writing, and as the man said each sin, he removed it with the reed. And this likely happened, for it is written, I will confess my sin to the Lord, and you have forgiven the evil of my heart. Also, I did this since there were others among the brothers who had sins they had not yet confessed to, and I wanted to encourage them to confess them as well, for without confession no one will receive forgiveness." I saw many other things that were excellent and worth noting, 
with that to be remembered shepherd and his herd. A good part of it I will try to bring to your mind as well, for I dwelt a long time with him, observing his way of life there, and I was amazed to see just how many of those dwelling on earth could mimic the heavenly angels. In this flock all were joined by the unbreakable bond of love, and what was even better was it did not involve too much closeness or gossip. Perhaps more importantly, they made every effort not to injure the conscience of a brother in any form. And should anyone display anger to another, the pastor would put him in isolation, like a prisoner. One time, when a brother spoke poorly concerning his neighbor to the pastor, that holy man immediately commanded him to be thrown out, saying, I will not allow both a visible and invisible devil in the monastery. I observed many things that were indeed advantageous and excellent among those holy fathers. I observed the brotherhood collected together and joined in the Lord with a most excellent active as well as contemplative life. For they were so preoccupied with heavenly thoughts and with the practice of good works that there was rarely any need for the pastor to instruct them in anything. For with their own consciousness they brought each other to godly alertness. For there were many godly practices which were set out studied and established. If the superior were absent and one of the brothers started to speak with foul language or speak ill of people or simply to speak idly, another brother, by means of a secret gesture, would make him mindful of this and make an end of it silently. However, if the brother did not observe the sign that the one who had gestured to him would make a prostration and withdraw himself. The ever-present topic of conversation when they spoke at all, was always on the remembrance of death and eternal judgment. I should not neglect to speak of the remarkable accomplishment of the community baker. He had reached the point of being ever mindful of God and weeping during his labor. I inquired from him how he obtained such gifts. When I urged him on the matter, he said, I never thought I was serving men, but God himself. And having decided I was unworthy of stillness, by the light of the baking oven fire, I am forever reminded of the coming fire. Let us take note of another achievement of them. For even at the dining area, they did not cease from meditation, but according to a certain practice, these blessed monks would remind each other of the importance of interior prayer by private signs and gestures. They not only did this in the dining area, but in each meeting. And should one of them make a mistake, the brother would offer many petitions to permit them to bear the accountability and the punishment from the pastor. This is why this most excellent man, on understanding that his disciples would do this, would give softer punishments, understanding that the one he would chastise was in fact innocent, and he would not even question the one who had made the mistake. Would there be any form of idle talking and jesting among them? If a brother started to argue with his neighbor, then a third, who is walking by, would take on the role of the penitent, and so would break up the argument. But on observing that the two were malicious or vengeful, he would bring an account of the argument to the father who is second to the superior, and thus set the path for the reconciliation before the sun went down. However, if they remained uncompromising, both would be disciplined by having their food withdrawn until they made amends, or they would be removed from the monastery grounds. It was not without purpose that this honorable sternness achieved perfection among them, for it brought forth much fruit. Of those holy fathers, many became excellent both in the active and spiritual life with humbleness and discernment. Often one would observe a terrible and heavenly sight, honorable old and white-haired men of angelic beauty running around in obedience as children and finding much joy in their humiliation. I have seen there men who passed fifty years in obedience. But when I asked them to relate to me what comfort they had achieved through their toil, some of them said a profound humbleness with which they could ward off any attack. Others stated that they achieved complete freedom from grief and slander and rebukes. I have observed still others of those memorable fathers with white angelic hair who have obtained a profound innocence and wise simpleness that is quick and led by God. In the opposite case, an evil man is one thing on the outside and another inside. But the simple one has unity of character. None of them are foolish and silly like many men in the world who are known as senile. Instead, on the outside they are completely meek and kind, radiant and true, and there is nothing hypocritical or false in their words or personality, a rare thing. And inwardly, 
in their soul. They are as simple babes, making God their superior with their every breath, while their mind stays alert to the wiles of demons and passions. My entire life, holy and sincere Father, and God-loving community would not be enough to relate the angelic life and excellences of those blessed monks. And yet it is more appropriate to decorate our writing and stimulate you to an eagerness in the love of God by their earnest struggles than by my own insufficient words. For above all debate, the superior decorates the inferior. This only I seek, that you should not think we are making up what is written, for such mistrust would detract from its worth. Instead, let us continue the former account. There was a man by the name of Isidore, a magistrate from Alexandria, who had of late given up the world at the aforementioned monastery, and I found that he was still there. That all-holy pastor, after taking him in, discovered he was replete with wickedness, cruelty, and a cunning, savage, and proud disposition. However, with human skillfulness, that very wise man came up with a way to trick the wiles of the demons. And he said to Isidore, If you desire to put on the yoke of Christ, then I desire first that you learn obedience. Isidore answered, As iron is to the blacksmith, so I yield my will to you, Holy Father. The excellent father, using this comparison, immediately gave an iron labor to Isidore, saying, I would like you, fleshly brother, to stand by the monastery gate, and to bow before each person entering and exiting, and to say, Pray on my behalf, Father, I am paralyzed. And as an angel is obedient to the Lord, so he obeyed. After spending seven years at this task, he acquired profound humbleness and remorse. After a hard seven years and great patience, the most excellent father considered him honorable enough to be one of the brothers, and he desired to affirm him by having him ordained. However, Isidore, through others, and at my own humble intercession, pleaded with the pastor numerous times to permit him to complete his mode of life, implying that his end and summoning were near. And this was indeed the case. For ten days after his spiritual director allowed him to continue in his lowest state, he went honorably to the Lord. And upon the seventh day after his death, the monastery gatekeeper also died. For that blessed man had told him, If I have found favor in the presence of the Lord, in a brief time you will also be forever united to me there. And this is what occurred, as a witness to his great obedience and heavenly humbleness. While he was alive, I questioned the great Isidore about what he had meditated on when he was at the gate. The well-known ascetic did not keep it secret from me, desiring to aid me. At the start, he said, I reckoned that I had been sold as a slave for my sins, so it was with resentment and great toil, and as one might say with blood that I made each prostration. But when a year had gone by, I stopped feeling grief in my heart, and I waited for a wage for my servitude to God. However, when a further year had finished, I started to be very much aware of my unworthiness, even to be in the monastery, and to be in contact with the fathers, and to partake in the divine ministries. And so I did not even attempt to look upon anyone's face, but I stooped low with my eyes, and even lower with my thoughts. With sincerity I begged for the prayers of those that entered and exited. At one time when we were sitting together in the dining hall, this most excellent superior put his holy lips next to my ear and asked, Would you like me to show you heavenly discretion in old age? And having entreated him to do just this, the holy man summoned Lawrence from another table, who had spent about forty-eight years in the monastic community and was the second priest. He came forward and made a prostration before the superior and received his blessing. When he got up, the superior said not a word to him, but proceeded to leave him standing, without eating, beside the table. Breakfast was only just served, and he had remained there for an hour or two. I was embarrassed to look up into the face of this laborer, for his hair was white and he was eighty years old. When he stood up, the saint dismissed him to the great Isidore, who was referred to earlier, so that he might repeat the beginning of Psalm 39. I, being a most useless man, did not neglect the opportunity of testing the old man. I inquired from him what he was meditating on when he was standing beside the table. He said, I thought of the pastor as the being the very image of Christ, and I reasoned that I had not received the order from him, but from God himself. So as I stood praying, Father John, not as in presence of a table of men, but instead as if being before the very altar of God. And on account of my trust and love for the pastor, no wicked notion about him came into my mind, for love is not bothered by a blow. But understand this, Father, 
If anyone gives himself to simple and voluntary innocence, he allows the devil neither time nor place to make an assault on him. God sent to that righteous savior of the spiritual sheep another just like himself to be the money keeper of the monastery. He was chaste and sober as none other, and gentle as few are. At one point, the great elder, for the instruction of the others, feigned being angry with him within the church and commanded that he be cast out before the proper time. Knowing that he was blameless of the charge of the pastor, I begged the case of the money keeper in the presence of the great pastor. But the sage said, I also know, Father, that he is innocent. But just as it would be unfortunate and wrong to take bread from the lips of a starving babe, so too the pastor of souls does ill both to himself and also to the ascetic if he does not allow him many chances to receive crowns which the pastor knows that he has earned each time he has endured insults, disgrace, scorn, or ridicule. For three terrible wrongs are done. For one, the pastor loses the reward for discipline and punishment. Second, the pastor acts unrighteously when, through the one person, he could have profited others, but neglects to do so. Thirdly, a most grievous injury is done to those who are the most laborious and long-suffering. For even a field which is good and bears fruit and is productive, if neglected of the water of shame, can return to being a forest, and it will bring forth thorns of pride, cowardice, and boldness. Understanding this, the excellent apostle wrote to Timothy, continue to admonish and discipline them both in season and out. I argued this point with that sincere pastor and brought to his attention the wickedness of our race and stated that either unmerited or merited punishment may cause some to leave the flock. But that temple of all wisdom said to me, a life which is attached to the pastor with love and trust for the sake of Christ will never allow him to leave him, even if it should cost him his own life. And this is most certainly true if he has received healing of his injuries, for he brings to mind him who said, Neither angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any other creature can divide us from the love of Christ. But should the soul not be attached and faithful to the pastor in this manner, then I question if such a person is dwelling here in vain, for he is bound to the pastor by a hypocritical and fake obedience. In truth, this excellent man was not deceived. For he has guided many, and led many to maturity, and has brought them to Christ as pure sacrifices. Let us be attentive and marvel at the wisdom of God, which is contained in earthly bodies. For when I was present in the same monastery, I was struck at the novices' trust and long-suffering, and at how they suffered censure and chastisement from the pastor with great strength, and even to outright ejection from the monastery. They tolerated all this, not only from the pastor, but also from those beneath him. For my spiritual instruction, I examined one of the brothers, Abasiris, who had dwelt in the monastery for fifteen years. I observed that practically everybody ill-treated him, and those who were involved in ministering threw him out of the dining hall almost every day, for the brother was simply a little too talkative. And I asked him, Brother Abasiris, why do I observe you being thrown out of the dining hall each day, and many times going to bed without dinner? He answered, Trust me, Father, the fathers are examining me to see if I am truly monastic material. However, they are not doing so zealously. And understanding this excellent man's goal and their own, I keep all this to myself without feeling dejected. And I have done this for fifteen years. For at my arrival in the monastery they related to me how one who gives up the world must be tested for thirty years. And it is true, Father John, without testing, gold cannot be purified. This courageous Abbasiris dwelt in the monastery for two years after I arrived. Then he went on to the Lord. Before he died, he said to the fathers, I am grateful to the Lord and you all, because you have tested me for the benefit of my salvation. I have dwelt here for seventeen years with no temptations from the demons. The excellent pastor rewarded him and commanded that as a witness he be entombed with the regional saints. It would be rather unjust of me to all those eager for perfection if I were to bury the grave of silence, the prize and glory of Macedonius, the foremost of the deacons there. He was so given to the Lord that just prior to the feast of Holy Theophany, in truth two days before it, he asked the pastor for a leave of absence to go to the city of Alexandria for his own private needs. He vowed to return as quickly as possible for the coming feast and to help prepare for it. But the devil, who despises all that is good, delayed the archdeacon, 
and though he had the permission of the abbot, he did not come back to the monastery for the holy festival at the appointed time. When he returned one day late, the superior stripped him of his diaconate and sent him at the rank of a newest novice. However, that excellent deacon of long-suffering and patient endurance submitted to the abbot's order as peacefully as if it had been another who had been rebuked and not himself. And after he had passed the forty days in that state, the wise shepherd again elevated him to his original position. But hardly a day had gone by before he begged the pastor to return him to his previous punishment and disgrace, saying, I have committed a sin which is unpardonable in the city. However, realizing that Macedonius was speaking a lie, he brought about a punishment only on account of humility. The saint consented to the good intention of the ascetic. Then what a spectacle to see! A dignified elder with his white hair, passing his days as a lowly novice, and truly begging each person to pray for him. For, he stated, I have fallen into the sexual sin of disobedience. But this excellent Macedonius, in private, related to me, low as I am, why it was he took such a humiliation of his own self-will. Not at any time, he confided to me, have I had a feeling of such alleviation from every trouble and such sweetness of godly light as at that time. It is the characteristic of angels, he said, not to fall, and for some even it is not possible for them even to fall at all, but it is the characteristic of men to fall, and then to get up again as many times as this should happen. However, it is the characteristic of devils, and them alone, never to get up once they have fallen. A brother who was the treasurer of the monastery once told me, when I was a youth and keeping watch over the cattle, I had a terrible spiritual fall. But since it had never been my practice to hide a snake in a hole in my heart, I grabbed it by the tail, by tail understand the conclusion of the matter, and presented it to the doctor. With a jovial face, he hit me moderately on the face and said to me, Away, my child, and persist in your labor as you did before, without having any fear. And receiving this with a fiery faith, after some days I obtained confidence as to my healing and steadfastly remained in my way with fear and gladness. Each animal, some say, has its peculiarities which mark it out from others. In the same way, among the brothers, there were distinguishing marks in success and in character. For if the doctor observed that some of them enjoyed showing themselves in front of the people of the world who were at the monastery visiting, then when in the company of the visitors he would give them awful rebukes and the most embarrassing work, so that they at once would make themselves scarce whenever visitors arrived. This ultimately was a victory and would offer the most amazing spectacle, vainglory pursuing herself and fleeing from the company of people. Since the Lord did not desire to leave me without the prayer of one of the holy fathers in the monastery, a week prior to my leaving, he brought me a most excellent man by the name of Minas, who was second only to the abbot. He had spent fifty-nine years of his life in the community in various positions. When he had finished the normal rites, on the third day after the death of this holy man, quite suddenly the entire space in which the holy man lay was filled with a sweet fragrance. Then the excellent man permitted us to reveal the coffin where he lay, and after doing this we all beheld a fragrant myrrh, which was pouring out as two fountains from his honorable feet. The instructor said to everyone, Behold, the sweat of his labors and toils which pour forth as myrrh acceptable to God. The fathers of the monastery spoke of the many victories of this holy Minas, and among them others the following was recalled. At one time, the abbot desired to try his God-given endurance. At the appropriate time in the evening, Minas went to the superior cell, and after prostrating before him, he asked to give him the usual lesson. However, the abbot left him on the floor until the time of the hourly office, and only at that point blessed him. And he reproved him for being desirous of attention-seeking and for being hasty. He then commanded that he get up. The holy man understand that Minas would take all this with courage, and so he made the spectacle of the instruction of everyone. A disciple of St. Minas verified all these things which were said to us by his teacher, and added, I was seeking to learn if sleep overcame him while he was prostrate before the superior, but he affirmed that while on the floor, 
he had gone through the whole psalter from memory. I should not neglect to decorate the crown of this step with this gem. At one time I started a conversation on the topic of silence with a group of the most skilled elders of the community, and with smiling faces and a joyful mood they told me in a pleasant way, we, Father John, being carnal, live in a material world, preferring to wage our war according to the measure of our feebleness, and we understand it better to wrestle with men, who at times wrathful and other times humble, rather than with demons who are always furious and warring against us. One of those ever-to-be-remembered fathers, who displayed a great love for me in God, quite candidly told me, If, dear wise men, you have present in you the strength of the one who said, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. If the Holy Spirit has come upon you in a dew of purity, as it did with the Holy Virgin, if the might of the Most High has overshadowed you with long suffering, then, like the Son of God, gird your loins with the belt of obedience, and having arisen from the dinner of silence, wash the feet of the brothers with a spirit of remorse, or indeed, roll under the feet of all those in the community in a spirit of self-deprecation. Place vigilant and strict guards at the gate of your heart. Keep in check your roaming mind in your distracted body. In the midst of movements of your members, exercise a mental quietness. And most strangely of all, in the middle of any distraction, be immovable in your soul. Restrain your tongue which storms into debate. Seventy times seven a day struggle with this tyrant. Set your mind to your soul as to the wood of the cross, which is struck as an anvil with blow after blow of the hammers to be derided, reviled, insulted, ill-treated, without in the least way being shattered or hurt but maintain a peaceful calm and be unmovable leave off your own desires as clothing of shame and having stripped it off enter the training ground arm yourself with the breastplate of faith which is rarely obtained do not be broken down or injured by mistrust in your spiritual director control the sense of touch that jumps forward unabashed by using the reins of self-control Bridle your eyes, which are eager to spend every hour gazing upon physical beauty, by contemplation of death. Muzzle your mind, which is over-concerned with private matters, and easily given to disparage your brother by loving your neighbor. By this all men will know, dear father, that we are Christ's disciples, if, when we live together, we show love for one another. Come, said this good friend, come and abide with us, and let the living water which you drink at all times, be scorn. For David, when he had tasted of every pleasurable thing under heaven, finally stated in disbelief, Behold, what is so good, or what is so beautiful? Only that brothers should live together as one. But if we have not been given this virtue of obedience and long-suffering, then it is most appropriate for us, having realized our frailty, to dwell separate from the athletic games and instead to glorify the contestants and pray that they may have patient endurance. The excellent reasoning of the most praiseworthy father and instructor won me over. He who reasoned with me in both an evangelic and prophetic way and also as a friend and without pause I consented to praise holy obedience. Now having made note of another advantageous virtue of these fathers which proceeds from paradise, I will return to my useless bunch of briars. The shepherd realized that some members would hold conversation with each other when we were standing in prayer. Such ones he made stand for an entire week beside the church and commanded that they do a prostration before each person that went in or out. What was even more remarkable was he enforced this even with clergy, including the priests. I observed one of the brothers standing during the psalms singing with a sincerity more than the others, and that his motions and shifts of his face made him appear as though he were talking with somebody else, particularly at the start of the psalms. So I asked him to elucidate me on what this manner of his meant. Understanding that it was for my gain not to conceal it, he said to me, I have the habit, Father John, at the start to organize my thoughts, my mind, and soul, and having collected them, I tell them, Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ, our King and our God. Having watched the affairs of the brother supervising the dining hall, I noticed that he had at all times a small book in his belt, 
I came to learn that he penned his thoughts in it every day and revealed them to the pastor. I observed that not only he, but many of the brothers did the same. This, I learned, was at the command of the excellent pastor. At one time, one of the brothers was thrown out by the pastor on account of defaming his neighbor to him and deriding him as a gossip. For an entire week, the one who was thrown out did not go from the gates of the monastery, entreating that he be allowed in and granted forgiveness. When the lover of lives found out about it, and that he had eaten nothing the entire time, he told him, If you had the steadfast longing to dwell in the monastery, I will bring you down to the rank of a penitent. When the penitent accepted this with eagerness, the pastor commanded him to be removed to another monastery, which is for those who grieve about their missteps. And this was done. And now seeing that we have spoken about this other monastery, we will touch upon it for a short time. A distance of one mile away from the great monastery, there was a place which is called the prison. It lacks every luxury. There is no smoke or wine or oil in their meals, and nothing was ever seen but bread and small vegetables only. It is here that the shepherd would imprison, with no allowance to be freed, the ones who had fallen into sin since they were in the brotherhood. All were not together, but instead each was in an isolated cell alone, or perhaps at most as a pair. He left them there until he received confidence from the Lord of their repentance. He appointed a sub-prior over them called Isaac, who mandated to those given to him that they should be almost unceasing in prayer. To keep them from despair, there was a large number of palm leaves. Such was the life and rule of the behavior of those who sincerely sought the face of the God of Jacob. To respect the toils of these holy ones is good. To imitate them brings salvation. But to desire suddenly to take on their way of life in every detail is not possible or reasonable. When remorse bites us, let us recall our sins unto the Lord, seeing the earnestness of our labors, the labors of those who do harm to themselves for the sake of Him, takes away our sins and changes the grief that is eating up our heart and turns it into joy. For it is written, According to the multitudes of the sorrows of my heart, your compassion has made joyful my soul. At the proper time, let us recall the one who said to the Lord, How numerous the problems and wickedness which you have revealed to me. And yet you return and renew me. From the depths of the earth when I had fallen, you again brought me up. Blessed is the one who, when reviled and rebuked each day, controls himself for the sake of the Lord. He will gather with the choir of martyrs and courageously speak with the angels. Blessed be the monk who examines himself each hour as being worthy of every dishonor and reviling. Blessed the one who puts to death his will until the end and gives the concern of himself to his spiritual director, for he will be appointed to sit at the right hand of the crucified one. The one that will not accept a rebuke, a righteous or unrighteous, gives up his salvation. But the one that concedes it with labor or without labor will in a short time receive forgiveness of his sins. Display to God in spirit your faith in your superior and your true love for him. And God in ways unknown will suggest to him that he should be joined to you and have concern for you just as you care for him. The one who reveals each snake shows that he has sincere faith. But the one that hides them will roam in trackless wastelands. A man will realize his love for his brothers and his sincere generosity when he observes that he grieves for the sins of his brother and has joy over his progress and virtues. The one whose will in conversation is set up his own opinion, even if what he is saying is true, should realize that he is cursed with the devil's illness. And if his brother is only like this when in conversation with his equals, a reprimand from his superiors may cure him. But if he does this even when those who are most excellent and wiser than he are present, then his sickness is without cure. The one who does not yield himself when talking obviously will not do so either in action. For the one who is not faithful in small things will not be faithful in many things either, for he is truly obstinate. This one toils for nothing, and will obtain nothing from obedience but his own destruction. If someone has a pure conscience in the point of obedience with his superior, then he daily waits for death as if it were sleep or indeed life. And he is not depressed, understanding that when the time of his departure draws near, not he, but his spiritual director, will be judged. 
If someone obtains voluntarily some chore from his father, and in accomplishing it suffers a fall, he should not blame the giver of the chore, but instead the one receiving the weapon. For he received the weapon in order to do battle with the enemy, and instead used it on his own heart. But if it be that he compel himself for the sake of the Lord to take on the task, although formerly he related his weakness to the one who has granted it, he should take courage, for even though he stumbled, he did not die. I have been neglected to put before you, my friends, this a sweet bread of virtue. I observed their men obedient to the Lord who constrained themselves to endure insults and disgrace for the sake of God, so that having instructed themselves in this manner, they became accustomed to being hurt by the rebukes that others gave. By being resolved to make a confession, the soul is then held back from sinning as by a bit. For the things we do not confess, we do without fear, as if in darkness. When the superior is not present, if we imagine that he is in our presence, and ever standing beside us, then we will evade every encounter, or word, or conversation, or food, or sleep, or anything else that we suppose he would not want us doing. Then we have learned genuine obedience. Fleshly born children are glad when their instructor is absent, but true ones perceive it as a loss. I once inquired from one of the most skilled fathers and entreated him to relate to me how humbleness is acquired through obedience. He stated, The one who is obedient is the one who has discernment. Even were he to raise the dead and obtain the virtue of tears and freedom from dispute, he will still suppose that it happened through the prayers of his director. In this way, he stays foreign to empty conjecture. For how is it possible that he could take pride in what he has accomplished if he tells himself that it is by the aid of his spiritual father and not his own labor? The work of the above virtues is not known to the one who is a solitary, for his efforts will produce pride and they carry the implication that his deeds are from his own labors. The one who remains in obedience has escaped from two traps and continues in the future as Christ's obedient servant. The devil makes war with those under obedience, at times to pollute them with fleshly defilements and to make them hard of heart, at other times to goad them into restlessness. At still other times he produces in them barrenness, slothfulness in prayer, and a sleepy, confused spiritual state of darkness, so as to pull them from their contest by leading them to believe they have achieved nothing through their obedience, but instead are moving backward for he does not give them time to think about the truth, that the absence of our imagined goods or blessings brings us to a deep, humble state. Still, some have repulsed the deceiver by long-suffering, and when he is still talking, another angel stands beside us, after a short time tries to trick us in a different way. I have observed some dwelling in obedience, who at the instruction of their father were filled with remorse, humility, self-control, zeal, and freedom from arguments. However, demons came to them and planted the thoughts that they were now ready for the solitary life. And in the solitary life, they would come to be free from passions as their last accomplishment. When tricked, they departed from their harbor and left for the sea. However, when a storm came upon them, they were horribly exposed to the hazards of the vile and loathsome sea without the aid of a navigator. This sea is certain to be aroused and agitated, so that it throws out onto the dry land the wood, dry grass, and all the pollution that was poured onto it from the streams of the passions. Let us take heed from nature, for we learn that after the storm comes a profound peace. Though one who at times is obedient to his father, and other times disobedient, is like the one who sometimes puts cream on his eyes, and other times lime. For it has been said, if one builds and another tears down, what is the benefit of the toil? Do not mislead, son, an obedient servant of the Lord, with the spirit of pride, so that you confess your sins to your superior as if they belong to someone else. It is not possible for you to escape embarrassment except through embarrassment. Frequently, the manner of demons is to convict us that either we should not confess, or to confess as if it is someone else's sins, or to put the blame of the sins on others. Strip barrier injury to the doctor, and with no shame say, This is my own wound, Father. It is my disease, which I have brought upon through my laxness, and not by others. No one can take the blame for this. No man, spirit, body, or anything else, save my own slackness. 
During confession, your manner should be that of a condemned criminal, both with your external appearance and inside your mind. Have your eyes fixed upon the ground, and if you can, with your tears, wet the feet of your judge and doctor, as if they were the feet of Christ. If all things rely on routine, and follow it, then all the more do virtues rely on routine, for God is their great partner. Son, you will not toil as many years seeking for blessed inner peace if at the start you give yourself over completely to insults. Never think that it is incorrect to state your confession to your director in prostration as before God. I have observed convicted criminals by the remorseful countenance and strong confession and appeal soften the harshness of the judge changing his wrath to pity. This is the reason why John the Baptist had confession as a prerequisite to baptism for those who approached him. Not that he had need of knowing their sins, but for the benefit of their salvation. Let us not be amazed if we are still assaulted following our confession. For is it more desirable to wrestle with ill thoughts than with pride? Do not be overly enthusiastic and carried away when you hear the stories of the solitary hermit fathers for you are part of the army of the first martyr. For if you do fall, do not abandon the training ground. For all the more we need a doctor. The one whose foot strikes a stone if he did not have help would not only have fallen, but would have died. When we are low, the demons rapidly assault us, and taking advantage of a reasonable and unreasonable excuse, they counsel us to take on the life of a hermit. The enemy's goal is to strike blows when we sin. If a doctor argues he is not competent, then you must go to another, since there are few who are made whole without a physician. Who would argue the point that any ship which is shipwrecked with a skilled navigator would not be completely destroyed if it altogether lacked a navigator? Humility produces obedience, and dispassion comes from humility. For the Lord recalls us when we are in our lowliness, and he redeems us from the hands of our enemies. Nothing stands in the way of saying that this passion comes from obedience. In this way, our aim of humility is achieved. For the start of this passion is humility. Just as Moses is the start of the law, and the mother is perfected by the daughter, and the synagogue is perfected by Mary. Those ill souls, who for a time rely on a doctor and obtain benefit from him, but then leave him for another before they are made whole, merit every chastisement from God. Do not turn away from the hand of the one who has led you to the Lord, for you will not in your life regard anyone as you do him. It is truly hazardous for a soldier that lacks experience to abandon his troop and undertake a lone attack. So also it is not without danger for a monk to try to be a hermit before he has gained skill and practice in the battle with animal lusts. The one brings peril to his body, and the other danger to his soul. Two are better than one, Scripture tells us. It is better that a son be with his father, and battle with his bonds, with the heavenly aid of the Holy Spirit. The one who has taken the leader away from a blind man, the shepherd from the flock, the guide from a lost man, a father from his son, a physician from his patient, a navigator from his ship, puts all in danger. The one who tries without help to fight with the spiritual beings is destroyed by them. Those who go to a hospital, let them first show their pains, and so those who go to obedience, let them show their humility. For the first, the primary sign of their well-being is the ease of their pains, and for the second, an increasing condemnation of oneself. There is no indication so accurate. It is enough that your conscience be a mirror of your obedience. Those in the solitary life under a father have only demons set against them, but those who live in a community must strive with humans and demons. The first group is under the eyes of their superior and keeps his instructions carefully. The second group, because of his absence, to some extent break them. But those who are cautious and labor are able to make up for this shortcoming by dealing with the conflicts and so win two crowns. Let us keep watch diligently over ourselves. For in a harbor full of boats, it is easy for them to knock against each other, especially if, although unseen, they are full of anger, as if with a worm. Let us exercise profound silence and lack of knowledge in the presence of the director. For a quiet man is the son of wisdom, forever taking in knowledge. 
I have observed a devout person who would take words from the lips of his director, and I despaired that he would ever be obedient when I observed that it led him to conceit and not to meekness. Let us be vigilant and awake, being concerned with how and when active duty should be favored over prayer, because one cannot do everything at every moment. Take heed to yourself when in the company of your brothers, and do not make it look like you are more correct than you are in any situation. For when you do, this will have committed two wrongs. You will hurt them by your incorrect and deceitful zeal, and you will give yourself a reason for arrogance. Have zeal in your soul, without displaying any of it externally, either by an outward sign or by hinting at it in your speech. This will only occur when you cease from looking down at your neighbor. But if you are given to doing this, become like your brothers, so that you do not differ from them only in your haughtiness. I observed an unskillful disciple, who when he was with a group of people boasted of his teacher's labors, supposing that he would win himself honor with another's harvest. However, he only received dishonor, because everyone would ask him, How is it that a naked, dry branch could sprout forth from a good tree? Not when we have bravely suffered the rebukes of our Father are we judged to be long-suffering, but when we suffer it from all types of men, for we endure it from our Father out of respect and as a duty. With earnestness drink rebuke and reviling from all that offer it, as if it were the water of life, for it cleanses the passions. Then a profound purity will rise as the sun in your soul, and the holy light will never become dim in your heart. If someone observes that the brothers are placated by his labors, he should not be arrogant in his heart because of this, because robbers are everywhere. Keep in mind, always, the one who said, When you have done all that is ordered of you, say, We are useless servants. We have only done what we are obligated to do. The final judgment of our toils will only be known at the time of our death. A monastery is heaven on earth. Let us therefore set our hearts on being like heavenly bodies ministering to the Lord. At times those who dwell in this heaven have hearts of stone, but at other times through remorse they achieve solace, in such a manner that they keep away from arrogance or pride, and they take away the weight of their toils with tears. A small amount of heat will soften a large lump of wax. Likewise, a small amount of dignity can soften, sweeten, and clear away quite suddenly all the wrath, rudeness, and uncivil hardness of our heart. Once I observed two men sitting in secret looking at the toils and listening to the moaning of the ascetics. One was doing this so that he could imitate them, the other so that when the time came he could ridicule and obstruct God's workers in their excellent toil, but not so irrationally quiet as to irritate and aggravate others. And be not slow in your walk and deeds when you are commanded to be quick, for if so you will be worse than those who are possessed and revolting. Many times I have observed, as Job states, souls that are slow of character, and at times from zeal. I was astonished at the variety of wickedness. The one who is not a solitary, but is present with company, cannot obtain so much benefit from psalmody as from being in prayer, for the multitude of voices makes the psalms indistinguishable. Always be struggling with your mind. When it roams about, summon it to return to you. God does not necessarily require from those who are still under the obedience that their prayer be altogether free from distractions. Be not depressed when your thoughts are taken from you, but stay at peace and constantly bring back your mind. Unceasing remembrance is fitting only for angels. The one who has, in private, made an oath to never give up from striving until his death and to suffer a thousand deaths of body and soul cannot easily stumble with faults. For the fickleness of the heart and the disloyalty to one's dwelling will forever cause falls and trouble. Those who with ease travel from place to place are total failures, for nothing is so fruitless as a lack of patience. If you chance upon an unknown doctor and hospital, simply act as if you are passing through and privately test the life and spiritual skill of those that are abiding there. And at the point you start to sense you are benefiting from the physicians and nurses and your illness becomes better, most especially with your particular illness, that is spiritual arrogance, then approach them and purchase them with the silver of humility, 
and write up a receipt on the paper of obedience, with the letters of good works with the angels bearing witness. Pull apart and destroy the paper of your will in their presence. By journeying from place to place, you will get into the habit of ruining the price with which Christ redeemed you. May the monastery be your grave before the grave, for no one will leave the tombs until the full resurrection. And some pious souls have departed from the graveyard. Look, they are dead. Let us entreat the Lord that this may not occur with us. At the point the senses find their instructions to be burdensome, the lazier come to the conclusion that they would rather spend time in prayer. However, when they are commanded to do something which is easy, they flee from prayer as if from fire. Some work at a certain duty, but to calm the mind of a brother at his petition they abandon it. Others abandon their work because of laziness. Others stick with their work because of egotism, but others because of zeal. If you have kept yourself through your requirements and observe that the eye of your soul is making no advancement, do not take an opportunity to leave. The true are true in all places, and the opposite is also correct. In the world, slander has resulted in many divisions, but in communities, avarice engenders every stumble and refusal. If you are master over your mistress, the stomach, every place you dwell will provide you dispassion. But if she subjugates you, then outside of the grave you will be in peril everywhere. The Lord who made the wise blind opens the eyes of those who are obedient to having virtue as their guide, and he blinds them to their faults. However, the one that hates good does the reverse. Let us discover in so-called Quicksilver the image of mature obedience. For no matter what material we roll it, it moves to the lowest point and will not mix with corruption. Let those who are eager take heed to themselves, lest by denouncing reckless they themselves bring about a worse condemnation. I believe Lot was just because he lived among such people, but he never seemed to have judged them. Let us always, and most especially when singing in the church, be silent and focused, because by distractions the demons try to make our prayers have no effect. The true servant of the Lord is the one who in body is standing before men, but in his mind is knocking at heaven with his prayer. Affronts, embarrassments, and other such things are like bitter wormwood to the soul of a novice, while praise, glory, and admiration are like honey and bring forth all kinds of sweetness to the lover of pleasure. But let us observe the character of each. Wormwood cleanses the dirty interior, but gall is increased with honey. Let us rely with a strong confidence on those who have taken up the task of caring for us in the Lord, even if they seem to command something which goes against our salvation. For it is at that point our faith in them is tested, as in a hot oven of disgrace. For it is a sign of the most sincere trust if we are obedient to our directors without any hesitation, even when we observe the opposite of what we desire to occur. Humility comes from obedience, as we stated before. Discernment comes from meekness, as the great Cassian has stated with excellent and splendid reasoning in his chapter on discernment. Understanding comes from discernment, and from understanding comes foreknowledge. And who would not go after this good path of obedience, noting that great blessings are prepared for him? For it was of this excellent virtue of obedience that the psalmist spoke of when he said, You have in your goodness prepared for the poor an obedient soul, O God. Your presence is in his heart. Over the course of your life, remember that excellent contender who for a full eighteen years never listened with his external ears to his director telling him, You might be saved. Instead, he heard from the Lord not the words, You might be saved, which is uncertain, but You are saved. Those who live in obedience, when they realize the haughtiness and extravagance of the director, seek his permission to go after their own will. But let them realize that when they receive this, they deprive themselves of a martyr's crown. For obedience is a complete stranger to hypocrisy and doing one's desires. There was a man who received a command, but realizing the intention of the one who asked it, that is, the doing of the command would not give him pleasure, asked to be released from it. Another observed this as well, but obeyed with delay. The question is, of the two, which acted more righteously? 
that the devil should act against his own desires is not possible. Those who live an easy life abiding in a place alone or a community will convince you of this fact. Let the desire to leave our place be evidence for us that our mode of life is well-pleasing to God, for being fought against is a sure sign that we are in a war. I cannot keep quiet about a matter which is not good to leave in silence for fear that I should unfairly keep to myself that which should be made manifest. The well-known John the Sabbite mentioned to me things worthy of hearing, that he was free from all untruth of speech and actions of wickedness, as you know from your own dealings, Holy Father. This man said to me, In my monastery in Asia, for this is the place where the excellent man was from, there was an elder who was reckless and lacked discipline. I speak of this not to condemn the man, but only to give the truth. He received, I am not sure how, a young disciple by the name of Acacius, who was simple but circumspect in mind. He tolerated such abuse from the elder as would seem amazing to many people. For each day the elder ill-treated him with rebukes, insults, and even blows. However, his long-suffering was not simply meaningless suffering. I observed him each day in his terrible state as if he were the most abased slave. I would inquire of him, What is the trouble, Brother Acacius? How are you today? He would immediately show me a black eye or a wound on his neck or head. And, understanding that he was a laborer, I would tell him, Well done, well done, suffer it, and it will be for your benefit. After nine years under the merciless elder, he had left to go to the Lord. After five days had passed from the time of his burial to the cemetery with the fathers, Acacius' elder went to an elder living there and told him, Father, brother Acacius is dead. When the elder heard this, he replied, Trust me, elder, I do not believe this. The other said, Come and see. The elder immediately got up and came to the cemetery with the elder of the blessed ascetic. Then he spoke to him, as if to a living person who is merely asleep and said, Brother Acacius, are you dead? The practicer of excellent obedience displayed his obedience even in death and replied to the excellent elder, How can it be, Father, for who keeps obedience to die? Then the elder Acacius became horrified and in tears fell upon his face. After this he asked the abbot of Lavra if he could have a cell near the tomb. He lived there piously, foretelling the fathers, I am a murderer. I suppose, Father John, that the one who conversed with the dead man was indeed the great John himself, because that blessed one related another story to me as if it concerned someone else, but it was in truth about him, as I was later to learn. There was another one, said John, in Asia, in the same monastery, who also became a disciple of a monk that was humble, meek, and quiet. And observing that the elder honored and had concern for him, he correctly judged that this would be lethal for most men, and he entreated the elder to have him depart. Since the elder had an additional disciple, this would not be much of a problem for him. And thus he left, and with a letter from his superior he came to dwell in Pontus, in a Cenobitic monastery. When he entered this monastery, on the first night he had a dream in which he saw his reckoning being rotted up by somebody and after finishing the account he was left with a debt of one hundred pounds of gold. After he had awoken, he pondered on what he had been shown to him in the dream, and said, O Antiochus, that was his name, you are sure to come short of your debt. And when I had lived for three years in this monastery in complete obedience, I was held in contempt by all, and was rebuked as an alien, for there was no foreign monk there. Then another time I saw in a dream a person giving me a credit note for the remittance of ten pounds of my debt. And arising from the dream, I pondered concerning the matter and said, Only ten? How will I pay the remainder? Following this, I said to myself, Woe to Antiochus! There is more labor and neglect for you. From that moment I started to feign being foolish, yet still not neglecting to minister to everyone. However, when the pitiless fathers observed that I readily ministered in that same state, they gave me all the hardest work of the monastery. In such a manner I toiled for thirteen years. Then in a dream I saw the one who had appeared to me previously, and they provided me with a bill for remitting the full total of the debt. Thus when the brothers of the monastery constrained me for anything, I brought to mind my debt and suffered it bravely. 
So now you understand, Father John. That wise John related all this to me as if it were about somebody else, which was why he used the name Antiochus, but in reality it was a story about himself who so bravely removed the handwriting by his endurance and obedience. Let us understand the virtue of discernment which this holy man acquired from his complete obedience. When he was dwelling in St. Saba's monastery, three young monks came to him desiring to be his disciples. He happily took them in and immediately was warmly hospitable to them, desiring to refresh them after their long journey. When three days had gone by, the elder told him, By my very nature, brothers, I am given to fornication, and I will not be able to take any of you. However, they were not offended, for they knew the excellent work of the elder. Still, no matter how much they asked him, they were not able to persuade him. Then they fell at his feet and entreated him to at least give them a rule how and where they should live. He gave in to their appeals, understanding that they would receive it with humbleness and obedience. The elder told one, The Lord desires you, dear child, to live in a solitary place under obedience to a father. And to the next he said, Go and sell your will to God and then take up your cross and labor in a cenobitic monastery, and you will surely have treasure in heaven. Lastly, to the third one, he said, Draw in with your breath the word of the one who said, He who endures to the end will be saved. Go, and if it is possible to choose as your mentor in the Lord, one who is a most exacting and demanding man. And in perseverance, every day drink down, reviling and derision as if milk and honey. Then the brother told the splendid John, Father, what if the mentor lives a careless life? The elder answered, Even if you were to see him engaging in fornication, do not abandon him, but tell him, Friend, why are you present here? Then you will observe that all arrogance and lust will disappear and dry up. Let all of us who desire to fear the Lord battle with all strength, so that in the university of virtue we will not obtain for ourselves animosity and depravity, cunning and guile, curiosity and wrath. For these things do occur, and no wonder. For so long as man is a private person, or a sailor, or a farmer of the ground, the king's enemies will battle against them. However, when the enemies observe him using the king's colors, and the shield, knife, sword, and bow, and clothed in the soldier's armor, then they grind their teeth at him, and do all they can to bring him to ruin. So let us be vigilant." I have observed pure and beautiful children attend school for the purpose of wisdom, instruction, and benefit, but through spending time with the other students they learn only guile and depravity. The wise will comprehend this. It is not possible for those who eagerly learn a skill not to make daily progress. Some see their advancement while others, by God's will, remain ignorant of it. A skilled banker never neglects to take account of the day's profit or loss in the evening but he is not able to see it clearly unless he adds it to this book every hour. For the hourly reckoning clarifies the daily tally. When a foolhardy person is blamed or yelled at, he is injured and tries to oppose it, or immediately he makes an apology to the one accusing him. This is not on account of meekness, but to stop the charges. When you are being mocked, be quiet and take with long-suffering these spiritual cleansing flames. When the doctor has concluded then ask his pardon. For at the point he is angry, it may be that he will not accept your apology. When battling with the passions, let those who dwell in communities toil every hour, most particularly against greed from the stomach and irritability. In a community there is much food for these passions. The devil advises those in obedience that they should undertake impossible virtues, while for those in solitude he gives unreasonable notions. Look into the mind of an unskilled novice, and you will discover distracted thoughts, and a longing for quiet, for the most strict fast, for unceasing prayer, for complete freedom from vainglory, for continual remembrance of death, for unceasing compunction, for complete freedom from anger, for profound silence, for complete innocence. And if by God's will they lack these things to begin with, they hasten worthlessly to a different mode of life and are tricked. For the enemy encourages them to pursue these excellences prematurely in order that they may not endure and achieve them in their time. But to those abiding in solitude, the deceiver encourages hospitality, works of mercy, brotherly love, life in a community, and visiting those who are ill. The devil's goal is to have the latter be as agitated as the former. 
There are but a few, and this is true, who are able to live in solitude. It is only those who have achieved godly comfort as support for their toils and divine help for their labors. Let us be judges of the character of our passion and of our obedience, and let us select our spiritual father in such a manner. For if you are given to lust, then do not choose as your instructor one who works miracles and is prepared to welcome everyone with a meal. Instead, choose an ascetic who will not accept any comfort in food. If you are prideful, then make sure he is harsh and inflexible, and not timid and caring. Let us not go after those who are gifted with foresight, but instead the ones who are completely meek, and whose character and dwelling place conforms to our illness. Let us follow the example of the previous discussed righteous of Osiris, taking his excellent custom which is so helpful for obedience, the continual thought that your director is testing you. With this truly, you will never sin. However, if your superior regularly criticizes you, and with it you gain great faith and a love for him, understand that the Holy Spirit is invisibly dwelling in your soul, and the power of the Most High has overshadowed you. Never boast or rejoice at the rebukes and insults you endure. Instead, be grieved that you committed something worthy of your ill-treatment, and that you have angered your director's soul against you. Do not be startled by the following words, because I have Moses to back me up. It is better to sin against God than to sin against our Father. Because if we anger God, our instructor can intercede for us. However, if he is angry with us, there is no one to intercede. However, really either case seems the same to me. Let us examine things closely and base our decision, staying alert as to when we should suffer in silence with thanksgiving the charges made against our director and at what point we should comfort him. I suppose that in every case, when insult is made, we should be quiet, because this is our time to gain profit. However, in those instances where there is another person, we should make a plea to keep the bond of love and harmony intact. The ones who have fled from obedience will relate to you its worth, because it was only at that point that they understood they had been living in heaven. The one who, fleeing to dispassion and God, sees as a tremendous loss any day he is not insulted. For just as trees which are pushed by the winds sink their roots deep into the earth, so also those who dwell in obedience get stronger and more firmly established in their souls. The one who has come to understand his weakness by dwelling in solitude, and then moved his place and put himself under obedience, has, without toil, regained his sight and seen Christ. Keep striving, brother athletes. I say again, continue running as you hear wisdom calling out to you. Just as gold in the oven, or indeed in a community, the Lord has tested them, and as a burnt offering he has taken them in his bosom. To him is the glory and endless dominion, with the Eternal Father and the Holy and Loving Spirit. Amen. The number of evangelists is equal in number to this step. Let the contestant keep running without fear.